Today, I'm speaking with Tetiana Filiewska, art manager, curator, writer, and researcher of 20th century Ukrainian art. Her experience encompasses festivals, conferences, exhibitions, educational courses, books, and films. She's worked in various art institutions, particularly the IDEM, um, IDOS Arts Development Foundation, Contemporary Art Center, Izolatsia, Platform for Cultural Inif Initiatives, um, I'm going to have to probably have a couple of goes at pronouncing this, uh, Mitsetsky Arsenal. Mitsetsky uh, yeah. Arsenal, co-founder of the NGO Malevich Institute. Tijan is also author of some of the leading books about Kazmir Malevich, especially focusing on his Kiev period from 1928 to 1930. She has sought to reverse the cultural appropriation that leads him to be labeled as a Russian artist and reclaim his Ukrainian provenance and identity. Tatyana teaches at the Ukrainian Catholic University and the Diplomatic Academy of Ukraine. Tatyana, please do tell me if I've missed anything out or got anything wrong there. <laughs> no, everything is fine. Uh, but my main affiliation at the moment is the Ukrainian Institute. It's Ukraine's main cultural diplomacy institution affiliated with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I'm the creative director there. That's fantastic. And of course, I have seen uh, a number of events. You you have traveled over to uh, to the UK and done some tremendous events. And I advise people to watch out for those. Ukrainian Institute has some absolutely remarkable speakers. And uh, if people are really on that side where they uh, are, are activists in support of Ukraine, I encourage them to also support the cultural sphere, not, not just discussions on military matters. Let's start with, with that then, um, because clearly we've had, it's going to be two years soon of extreme aggression and horror, yet the scale and scope of projects that you've been involved in uh, is, is enormous. How do you keep your focus and energy uh, with everything that's going on around? Uh, well, first, I, I would like to draw your attention that there are two Ukrainian institutes. Ukrainian Institute London is a separate entity. We are partners. We do a lot together, but they are operating on their own. <clears throat> and Ukrainian Institute, uh, which is a state institution located in Kyiv with offices in Berlin and soon in Paris is, is a state Ukrainian institution. Uh, but I mean, both Ukrainian Institute have been very active and have, we've, we've, we've done things together. And Ukrainian Institute that I'm um, affiliated with has, uh, has realized a big program in the UK also. We did it together with the British Council. It was UK-Ukraine season of culture. Uh, which ended up uh, a huge program of uh, more than 100 events all together with the Eurovision um, program, cultural program around Eurovision in Liverpool um, earlier this year. Um, how do we do it? Well, I mean, all of us, I mean, Ukrainians, we just want to do as much as possible on our um, on our place where we, you know, we are what we do best. Uh, of course, we all try to volunteer and help the, the guys at the front line, the armed forces. But we also understand that the, 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 the work we do, the cultural diplomacy and uh, um, communications around it is crucial for international support of Ukraine, for getting to know us better, for understanding what is behind the struggle, how we manage to resist this uh, huge uh, um, aggressor. Uh, so, I mean, this is also part of our responsibility in this resistance, doing as much as we can and even a little bit more. And you're traveling backwards and forwards. You're obviously, uh, that must come with its own stress and strain. Travel, of course, is far more problematic now because there's no air routes or safe air corridors. So you have time getting use of trains, vehicles, coaches, whatever. It's a complex business of traveling, but also you're getting to hear lots and lots of voices over this period. Do people, certainly in the circles that you interact with, are they coming to understand Ukraine and its distinctness um, better? Or do you still find that you're hearing voices that demonstrate that people don't get you know, the subtleties or, dare I say, even worse, have been influenced by Russian propaganda narratives? Well, first about travels. <laughs> yes, um, 
um, you know, before the invasion, it would take about three hours to get from Kiev to London with a direct flight. And now it's uh, uh, sometimes up to two days because you have to take a night train and then travel to the nearest airport and then take your flight. So sometimes it, it ends up being like two days. Uh, of course, it makes it much more difficult to to travel fast and to travel often. Uh, and me personally, I spent a year in London last year, so I had a chance to be uh, more deeply um, involved in in the local uh, scene in London and had lot uh, had lots of uh, opportunities to talk to people. I think things are changing very fast, considering that usually people need time to get to know something new and to understand it deeper, especially if they are not, uh, you know, particularly interested in the topic. I mean, they're not working as researchers a particular uh, country or particular history um, when they are doing their, you know, everyday work. And it's just one of the topics on their agenda. So we know that sometimes it needs years and years uh, for people to, to learn, to understand, to uh, change their attitude and change their behavior. But I think because of the brutality of the Russian invasion, um, it, it, people had the motivation to understand what is happening. So there was much more information, much more attention to it. And from my own experience, I think people are moving very fast in, in terms of understanding the, the reality and the real essence of the Russian uh, aggression against Ukraine and this neo-colonial war. Um, of course, for a deeper understanding, we'll need time, we'll need more interaction, more experience. And that's where culture can, can help people to dive in, uh, into the other experience, into the other culture. Because um, one thing is just reading an article in the newspaper with statistics and facts. And another, th another thing is watching a movie or reading a book about fascinating, you know, stories, about fascinating people, about interesting, um, interesting stories. And that makes a deeper, more emotional relation to the to the issue, to the topic. So I think the more opportunities we'll have to show our culture, to uh, give people an, an, an opportunity to experience our culture through books, through films, through theater, the more kind of deeper understanding will of Ukraine will have. And do you think art and artists is a very good way to actually help this education process? If we take an artist like Kazimir Malevich or slightly different period, one of my favorites was Ilya Repin, coming to understand their local context, their local influences, rather than seeing them as a you know, almost divorced from history, divorced from locality, labelled as Russian. Is it is it effective uh, because people, you know, people fixate on individual artists and their output? Is this quite a good way to 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 start that? Uh, you know, reappropriating um, uh, Ukrainian artists. I think it's a perfect case to learn about the complexity of history uh, of our territory. So we're not just bloodlands, as Timothy Snyder refers to our land. We are also places of talented people. You know, Kazimir Malevich was born in Kiev. Who knows about that? Why, you know, what, what kind of impact Ukrainian culture had on him? You know, why did he become an artist he became? You will never understand this if you don't know his Ukrainian biography, if you don't know that he considered Ukrainian um, uh, folk culture it's his uh, first uh, uh, art education, because that was the, the case. He learned to paint and, and draw from Ukrainian peasants in, in the villages, you know, and it made a huge impact on his uh, perception of visual um, visual in, in imagery, and he referred to it later in his artworks. Or let's say the uh, Kiev Art School, which was his first uh, professional uh, education. I mean, it was not, he didn't graduate from it, but it was the first experience he got to meet a real artist in his studio. And it was Mykola Pemonenko, Ukrainian famous uh, romantic 
uh, artist. And Malevich referred to Pimonenko in many of his artworks later on, you know. So, but if you don't know the the this Ukrainian part of his biography and Ukrainian part of his story, you will never understand the whole complexity of his art and all the influences that you know were meaningful and important in his uh, in his life and work. So I think it's crucial to to add dimensions to these artists who had often uh, complex identities they were not single you know they, they they didn't have a single identity because no one has single identities in the empires and they were definitely people of of that time so they 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 had these complexities malevich was of the polish background growing up in ukraine surrounded by ukrainian culture but being a part of this big um, entity is, is the Russian Empire. So that was his his uh, his life, his um, uh, experience. He also has spent a, a meaningful time in Vitebsk and in Belarus, in Belarus, and it was important for both the community there and himself. So we can say that he's connected to many more than just even two cultures. You know, so easily three or four cultures can. Uh, relate to him and can say that he was important and meaningful in their context and we don't have to forget about it and when we call him just a Russian artist we, we forget about all other identities or we say well they are not important they are not meaningful it's just this one that's important but who 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 made this choice for him you know he didn't make it he called himself a Ukrainian you know so why do we decide to call him Russian and is there a responsibility on uh, art institutions, galleries, and even the viewing public to take more of an interest in historical context? Because there's a tendency, I think, to look at abstract art and try to strip it away of this sort of, you know, the the, the chains of, of locality and history. Look at it as something pure and abstract. Um, but that is stripping away, I guess, certainly identity uh but it's also potentially stripping away layers of of meaning that could add richness to those works as well well uh first of all um we um yeah we don't have to 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 give people of, of, from other uh, of that lived in a different time the um, meaning of words that we use in our time, you know, so the, the notion of identity or nationality back 100 years ago or 140 years ago, when Malevich was growing up, you know, it was a different notion. And uh, uh, by uh, kind of giving them the the titles that we refer to in, in regards of, to our identity is just uh, not correct. You know, it's not it's not correct from our side. Um, uh, what what you are saying about this kind of um, international um, international movement in arts, yeah, making art go outside the boundaries of a particular country or a particular culture, it's absolutely correct about any art of twentieth or twenty first centuries. You know, since we started to transit the border, since we started to overcome the obstacles and challenges and different things that divide us, instead of bringing us together and of course Malevich was one one of the prominent people of that generation who had a dream that people not only transcend the borders but they all also can um um you know they can uh, leave the the borders of 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 the earth of the land and can transfer to to you know the open space that was the dream of malevich you know people who can live in in the space and that's why he built his um cities for 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 the space for the cosmos um but you know the intention that these artists had to overcome the borders does not mean that they were not influenced by certain countries and so certain cultures that uh that built these people that built these uh, artists and uh you know with these cultures certain structures of relationship in the society certain uh, values were trans transferred and as we know even the international movement has certain national features or certain national um, um, kind of elements or, or um, dimensions. So we can say, yes, the avant-garde was an international movement or abstract art was invented in several 
uh, uh, several s uh, spots on Earth at the same time, but it was, you know, a little bit different in each particular uh, area because it was in, in, you know, in, in, um, inspired by a different type of art. While Picasso was inspired by African masks, Malevich was inspired by Ukrainian folk art, you know, and you cannot neglect that. You, you learn about Picasso through African masks and through African folk culture, you know. The same way here, you know, you learn about abstract art and suprematism in the relationship or regarding the this culture that influenced it or had some kind of impact on the artist who created it. So you don't want to neglect it. You don't want to diminish it. You don't want to ignore it. You know, you want to say, yes, it, it, it was important. It was a step forward on this way. So it doesn't mean that they were not international. Yes, they were. And that was their dream. And uh, they, in some ways, they reached that, that goal. But uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that the nations and separate and national cultures uh, ceased to exist after that. They didn't. So there is certain meaning for, for national cultures to exist. And of course, even if the artist wants to transcend the limitations of those boundaries, it doesn't stop political uh, definitions or political organizations from trying to reclaim them or claim them as their own. <laughs> and of course, here, specifically thinking about the USSR and, and Russia uh, and labeling these artists as Russian, trying to tie their modernist energy to the you know the the russian project through or the soviet project um again is is imposing certain labels isn't it on these artists they may not necessarily have recognized or wanted to be part of but there's there's several different processes of appropriation that have gone on uh, with many of these artists yes and we have to remember history also not just one part of history but all of it and we have to remember that in the 30s, uh, so-called formal arts and formal was everything that was not social realism. Uh, so all of avant-garde was formal art. It was forbidden in the Soviet Union and artists were literally exterminated. They were sent out to Siberia. They were sent out to camps and prisons. And some of them just had to refuse uh you know their their arts their their work and had to become social realists in order to survive and malevich was one of the victims of this also so he was his last years of life he actually did not have any uh, opportunities to to develop his practice to work to study to to teach um, he had a little period when he could return to his practice in Kiev when he was invited to work at the Kiev Art Institute, where he continued to work as a teacher, as a professor, and as an artist, and he exhibited and published his articles. Uh, but soon, even this window closed in the 30s, and then there was this extermination of the whole generation of uh, avant-garde artists in Ukraine, so-called executed renaissance, which uh, took uh, uh, lives of hundreds of artists. So they were all physically exterminated. They were all killed. Um, <clears throat> all their over all their books were taken out of libraries and burnt and destroyed. So uh, it was an um, intention and not only intention, but it was a practice of Gen it was a genocidal practice against a certain culture, a certain identity through culture. Uh, so, um, I mean, we have to remember that the Soviets did this to to the uh, to the avant-garde art, you know. So, and now claiming that this was a very prominent uh, movement in the Soviet times uh, is just you know half of the truth because it was also. Um, prohibited, it was uh, destroyed, yeah, and we know how much of this was lost because it was just burnt and uh, you know thrown out on the on, on the garbage and on the on the trash. So, um, uh, so yeah, and of course we understand that at certain point when it was, um, um, how to say, it was convenient <clears throat> to, for the Soviet Union because they could also <clears throat> earn money and also make their um, um, connections with the West through art. Yeah, so, I mean, it was manipulated. It was a, a way to manipulate art, to use it as an instrument for something else. 
And the same happened as just a few years ago when there was this uh, number of exhibitions all over the world in London and in Paris and in New York saying that Russian revolution is Russian avant-garde and here's the here is the exhibition telling you about it. And, you know, no one cared that avant-garde actually as the artistic movement, uh, it existed before the revolution. So the revolution did not uh, create the avant-garde. It was vice versa because the avant-garde movement was appropriated by the Bolsheviks in order to, you know, support the revolutionary movement because it was very, very um, um, provoking, very... Um, um, you know, working as, as a good advertisement and uh, uh, just supportive to, to, to the ideas of revolution. And you, you, you absolutely almost answered the question I was going to ask about that. And this is the weaponization of art. Well, we'll tackle the modern weaponization of it. Um, but let's let's stick with this modernist movement, because if you look at um, political practice uh, in the USSR, it's deeply anachronistic. It's it's extremely vertical. It's based on terror, coercion. To me, it's a throwback to very ancient and very horrific behaviors. And yet they're co-opting the energy and the forward-looking, uh, future-focused character of abstract art. It's a highly effective propaganda tool, isn't it? Because many in the West who um, consider themselves as more radical and progressive, that allowed them to, in some way, uh, or I should probably pose this as a question, did it did it um, actually enable them to overlook the fact that the USSR, Russia, was an imperialist colonial entity? Um, and this provided a kind of intellectual smokescreen uh, to allow you know, the Russian political system to hide in plain sight, essentially, all this time? Uh, well, um, partially, yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the Soviet Union and the Russian state uh, was pretending to be not an empire while it, while it was uh, always an empire, and they used different tools to kind of... Uh, um make themselves look good <laughs> better than they were uh and of course art was one of the tools that helped them not the only one they also used you know education for example of for foreigners for people uh from um let's say so so-called global south here yeah, from african countries and asian countries and uh, latin america um so um but yes uh Art was very efficient and abstract art and avant-garde art was very efficient tool in order to um, pretend, pretend be not an empire. Um, but it was also not, um, it was not the essence of art itself. It was the way it was manipulated because the artists themselves, they were not communists. And if you look back into the beginning of, of so-called revolution, many of these artists, including Malevich, for example, they had different political views. Malevich was publishing his articles in the newspaper uh, uh, Anarchy. So he was closer to the anar anarchical views than communist, you know. And if you read his diaries of that time, he calls Bolsheviks the, the devils of, of time. He doesn't like the people, actually. Yes, later he does work with them because they eventually, you know, gain the, the power and that's the only way to, to live in this country. And he becomes uh, part of the even bureaucratic system of the new uh, Bolshevik state. But originally he was not his choice. He was not his ideology. So, um, I mean, many of these artists had more utopic views and of course, none of them expected the Soviet state to turn out a terror, a terroristic, autocratic, and uh, um, uh, just violent empire, killing millions of its own people in camps and and terrorizing, you know, uh, cultural cultural communities. So none of them expected this to turn out like this. So many of researchers and historians call it a tragic marriage when. 
uh, at first uh, uh, artists of the avant-garde movement, they supported the revolution, but later revolution killed them, you know, just 10 years later after it, 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 the Bolsheviks came to power. So it was, was a tragedy. Um, so, um, and I think it just continued throughout years, the way that Bolsheviks manipulated the avant-garde art in the early uh, in the early years of revolution is very similar to how the Russian uh, Federation manipulates avant-garde now, uh, using it as an uh, instrument to propagate uh, itself as a great culture. And, you know, when uh, the, the, the director of Hermitage, who opened an, actually an exhibition of avant-garde art, at the same time as the Russian troops were crossing the borders of Kiev region and killing civilians in Bucha and Erpin, he was opening an exhibition with Malevich's Black Square, you know, and at the same time he was saying that every exhibition of Russian art in the West is a kind of a special operation of Kremlin against the West, you know, so he confessed that openly he opened up that strategy kind of very uh, directly. So he he's saying that we are just manipulating. We are just using this art to gain our political um, goals. And how effective is the art world at understanding that and resisting it, or 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 is the anti-national art market um, not not great? at seeing the sort of subtext behind the you know, exhibitions and things you've described? Uh, well, I think it's very, it's very difficult to, to, to explain because there is this notion that culture is outside of politics. Um, I think it's a very dangerous formula. It's a very dangerous um, uh, sentence because culture is always politics culture is always political it cannot be otherwise it's not art it, otherwise it's decoration you know if it doesn't have any politics in it it doesn't have any sense in it because culture is about values and you know if, if you have values if you have senses there there is always politics. There is always um, relationship between, uh, you know, between people in society. There is always some kind of structure, power uh, structure inside that. So culture is never outside politics. Um, and I think that it's very important for the um, European world to 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 remember that, to understand that. And to um, actually understand that art and culture has has the responsibility, uh, and it has to be conscious about the senses and the essences it supports, um, because it, if it doesn't have this responsibility, then it can play the evil role, you know, just but not realizing, not knowing it. Um, so I think it's very important to remember it and to look at it like that. So I think that's where this um, um, this demand of Ukrainians uh, and Ukrainian culture community comes from now. You know, we are often blamed that we don't want to speak to Russians. We don't want to sit down and discuss with Russians how to deal with it. But uh, I mean, Russians uh, attacked us. I mean, as as a as a country, as a state, it was not just Putin. It was hundreds of thousands of people who have families, ending up millions of Russians responsible of supporting and financing and organizing all of this. And if culture and art, a cultural and artistic community, is part of society, it has to have its own responsibility in this society for what is happening. And if they have not done anything to stop this, if they have not done anything to talk to their soldiers that they would not go to attack a sovereign state and kill civilians this would might not happen you know and if this artistic community totally failed its its, its job its work in their society what what else do we you know do we expect to hear from them and that's an interesting point yeah i mean that's an interesting point when you tie it to the statement of the director um of uh, the Hermitage, 
And this isn't just isolated. I think, you know, you could probably apply the same to all sorts of, you know, performing arts uh, and, and, and cultural institutions. Um, on the one hand, individual Russians might try to pretend that art is neutral, that it has a non-political purpose in life. And yet what they'd be ignoring there is the, 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 the black and white statements of the cultural leaders, administrators, organizers that actually know that this is all a weapon. Everything is weaponized and everything can be weaponized. Is this part of the problem as well that you know you, you can't appear with individual Russians if they don't acknowledge uh, these facts that are already in the public domain about the weaponization of everything? Well, um, uh, that included, yes, of course, because uh, you know um, it's a very convenient position saying that it's not me. You know, you have you you can't blame me. I have nothing to do with it. I'm just an artist. You know, I'm just dancing here. I'm just singing here. And then go into the occupied territories like Netrebko is doing, you know, she went to to the occupied territory wearing the the uh, black and orange stripes uh, saying that, you know, uh, uh, we can conquer Berlin once again, you know, and now she's playing in Berlin opera and every, every, everyone seems to be OK with this uh, and uh, uh, recognizing that everyone especially the artists are responsible yeah they all have to do with it means that all the russian society takes on the responsibility for what is happening with their country and with their society um and of course um naming the things they are saying that this is a neo-colonial war that we're trying to occupy a sovereign state it's not a conflict between two countries it's not a, a matter of a certain a population that has, you know, some kind of choice. No, it's a different thing. So it's a, it's an uh, uh, ongoing um, um, colonial uh, aggression against a, a different country, a different uh, nation. So definitely recognizing that art is used as a weapon, and art is never neutral. And I mean, I think that. You know, most of museums have already recognized that, you know, just uh, showing Benin bronzes in, in the British Museum is not neutral. It's the result of the of the imperial war. It's an, a result of imperial um, violence because these Benin bronzes were taken off, you know, in a, in a colonial um, um, affair, you know. So and you cannot say that we are here just protecting the heritage no it was stolen one day from people and it has to be you know returned one day and you've written a very sort of fascinating piece about the idea that putin fears culture and that might not be unique to him that could be traced back through the soviet union and so on and the appropriation and relabeling of art neutralizing the ukrainian identity because Ukraine identity, independence, strength is something to be feared, crushed, dominated, subverted. But specifically, what do you think Putin's relationship is um, to art generally, but also specifically uh, art that has a Ukrainian uh, sort of character? Well, I think all authoritarian leaders are scared of real art, you know, because uh, uh, art is... is uh, um, um, is the place where people are free to express themselves. And this is the fear of authoritarian leaders. They don't want people to be free to express themselves. You know, they want people to be just elements in, in, in a system, in a, in a machine. Uh, and of course, uh, Rus Russian, well, I mean, Putin as the imperial Russian leader, he's scared of Ukrainian art because Ukrainian culture is the essence of Ukrainian identity. And even at the times when Ukraine did not have its statehood, we did not have the opportunity to be a sovereign, independent country. We practice our identity through culture. We spoke our language. Our poets wrote books and poetry in Ukrainian language. They managed even to print it or to you know, handwrite it. 
our uh, artists depicted Ukrainian life and Ukrainian people. So we practice our identity through culture. And it was the only way to be yourself, you know. So it was, of course, uh, a threat to the empire because growing your identity, um, nurturing it, you know, developing it is the um, threat to the empire because eventually one day people will say we have the right to be ourselves. We have the right to practice our language, our culture, our future. We want to build our future ourselves. So that's why Russian Empire always uh, um, prosecuted Ukrainian language. And, you know, we can remember these uh, laws and these uh, um, uh, documents, these decrees that did not allow to publish in Ukrainian, to study in Ukrainian, to teach in Ukrainian, to make plays in Ukrainian, you know, even theater, Ukrainian theater was forbidden. People, you know, the only way people uh, were, were allowed to practice their identity was oral culture. So that's why we are the most singing nation in the world, because you know, you cannot per uh, stop people from singing. You cannot persecute everyone who is singing. That's why our folk songs are so meaningful and so important in our culture, because basically that was the only way we were allowed to be ourselves through singing. You know, that's why there's there are so many songs about this current war, because it relates us to our previous generations who were also fighting through songs, you know, so it's also our way to resist. Um, yeah, so I mean, even a song can threaten uh, uh, Putin as a totalitarian leader, because in our songs, we are singing that we will fight the enemy, that we will uh, liberate our country and we will be free and strong one day, you know, so it's it's the way to nurture the mission, the, the vision of future for our nation, for our society. And one thing that struck me quite forcefully the first time um, I was in Russia was the role of so-called um, canonical cultures. So that is, you have canons of literature, canons of art, you have particular works, particular artists that are included in this you know almost like a state sanctioned list and everyone talks about them quotes them whatever if you haven't read them or haven't seen them somehow you know you, you you're seen as inferior and uh as a poorly educated you know british person uh i i didn't know all of these things and, and 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 therefore um often i think was 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 judged for it um but in a wider context what is the mechanic the imperial mechanic of that because here you have a very vertical kind of approach to culture defining what is great and what isn't um does art and culture in ukraine reflect its much more sort of horizontal much more chaotic democratic uh kind of identity um well in totalitarian society every everything is restricted and of course, you know, the canon is is what supports the idea of the of these totalitarian states. So, you know, take any uh, can canonic Russian writer, I mean Pushkin or Tolstoy, they were all they were all filled with imperial narratives. And what they describe is the the essence of imperial aggression that Russia uh, took against uh, and aggressive campaigns that uh, Russia took against other nations and 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 countries, you know. So, um, and of course they they make it a canon because they want to 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 bring up new people that will be um, sharing these values. You know, the values not always something positive. You can have negative values also, you know, value of, of an empire, you know, being aggressive as an, as, as a value. And that's why they are, that's what they are nurturing through this canon, you know, so they want to bring up this, uh, the, 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 the nation and the, the people that think that, you know, killing and raping others and looting is good thing. And this is what Pushkin and Tolstoy describe in their in their poetry and their novels, you know, how to how to do it and how to feel okay after that and, and feel that, you know, you're doing something good after doing these things to, to others because they're not really people, uh, because they're not Russian. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, in terms of Ukraine, we don't have a canon. 
And there was actually a discussion just before the invasion started, if we need to build something like a golden canon of Ukrainian literature. Um, and this discussion was so long and so broad and so horizontal that we didn't end up with the with any canon. I mean, we of course have like these canonic figures like Taras Shevchenko, Lysa Ukrainka, and Ivan Franko, but they're kind of leading figures that had this idea of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian nation. So they were also kind of fathers and a mother of a nation because they led this um, uh, this ambition to, to, to be a sovereign, to be independent, you know, to fight because they were the fighters themselves. They are um, uh, in, inspiring and supporting this... Uh, um, this intention of liberation from from the imperial uh, violence. So I think uh, they are canonic, of course, you know, but it doesn't mean that they cannot be criticized, for example. And there is a negotiation, there is a conversation, for example, about Russian speaking literature in Ukraine now, because lots of Ukrainian writers were writing in Russian, because that was the only language that you were allowed to write in and be published, you know. So, for example, Hogol, he started writing because he wanted, you know, to become a writer. So he wrote in, in Russian. And so did Shevchenko, for example, who is a number one Ukrainian poet, and he has novels in Russian language. And there is a discussion, you know, how do we put Russian language in the canon of Ukrainian literature? Good question. I mean, discussion is still on. <laughs> and it's an interesting contrast, isn't it? Because, you know, we, we're talking about modernism here. We're talking about these writers who are very forward looking. They're looking forward to uh, a sort of uni Ukrainian nationhood that may not have existed, certainly politically didn't exist at that time very sort of forward looking and, and and seeking to sort of define possibilities for the future however russia has been characterized as a very uh, nostalgic backwards looking culture um a culture that shuns modernity uh, and and actually fears it fears the chaos of the future when they appropriated um the avant-garde art could this be characterized not as embracing the future, but actually a way of trying to dominate, control, and, and even shut down the future? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And exactly, well, th they did exactly it when they exterminated the artists. So they physically controlled the future of the avant-garde because they did not allow the artists to do their art anymore, you know? So they either killed them, put them into prison, or they just did not allow them to continue their practice, you know, so like some of them, for example, Rochenko, he just, you know, turned into social realist, and he started just uh, praising the, the Stalinist uh, regime and Stalin's power and Stalin himself. So, <clears throat> I mean, they literally took control over the future of avant-garde, physically. And absolutely, that was the idea behind it, because, you know, avant-garde had this revolutionary potential. They had avant-garde is an energy to change things, to overcome things, to literally, you know, criticize the the, the foundation of society. And of course, the totalitarian society that the Soviet Union became very soon in, in the 20s, in late 20s, it was already, you know, <clears throat> quite an... Uh, 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 brutal, uh, violent uh, state of uh, uh, control and, uh, uh, and and domination, and uh, of course they didn't need art that would shake it or or ask questions about it. Of course, so they you know they just stopped it. They just did not allow it. And does art is one of those mechanics of art to sort of suggest there are multiple futures? Um, and and help people to sort of understand that it's not fixed. And if you compare that to the intent of, say, the Soviet regime, surely the intent they had was to say, well, there is only one future. There aren't a multiplicity of futures. There's one future. We know what it is. This is what it's like. And any deviation from that is going to be punished severely. That surely is a complete negation of, of, of the whole purpose uh, in some ways of art. 
Absolutely. And if, uh, you know, art has the idea that the better future is still ahead, the totalitarian state says that the best thing we had is behind us in the past. So we just have to praise the past because nothing better can happen in the future unless we just return to what we were in the past, you know. So that's the whole idea of this imperial totalitarian society. And of course, art has the power to imagine a better future and create this better future. And avant-garde was also about it. They were dreaming, you know, to, to make better world for people. And this is exactly what they did, um, um, you know, in, um, in Europe, elsewhere, you know, where they were allowed to. Uh, but uh, yeah, of course, it, it was something that didn't fit the construction of the Soviet totalitarian state. Now, I've just got two questions. I'm going to fire both questions you uh, at the same time, but it's sort of two separate questions. One is, of course, the war is not over. Um, nobody, including all the military experts I've spoken to, are at all comfortable in putting a time frame on when it'll end. Many, many do believe it'll end in Ukrainian victory and the comprehensive Ukrainian victory, which I think is the only way to create a secure and stable state. But a lot of art and artists have been destroyed uh, over this uh, year and a half. Um, there is the potential that still more losses uh, will, will, will come. So the first question really is what the impact of the war has been in terms of the sort of loss of artworks and artists. And the second question, which is sort of tied to that, is what is the role uh, of Ukrainian art in resisting uh, this imperial and military aggression? Um, well, the harm that has been done to Ukrainian culture is um, is awful, terrific, uh, in terms of destruction of cultural heritage sites, museums, in terms of number of museums that were looted and the uh, artworks that were looted and you know, both in, in the past year and a half, in the past 10 years, because, you know, since the occupation, the temporary occupation of Crimea and uh, Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast, they were excavating illegally uh, archaeological objects that will never be able to, you know, uh, identified and returned. Uh, they, of course, have been uh, looting and destroying libraries and uh, museum, uh, I mean, museum objects. <clears throat> but the worst thing is, of course, lives of our artists. And we will never forget the losses of, you know, poets like Victoria Melina or um, musicians and filmmakers and and so many other people who were meant, you know, to to create their masterpieces still in the future. They were young. They were just, you know, in the in the early stages of their career. They were talented and they were super uh, inspired and motivated. And they went to, you know, um, to protect their country, to protect their families. And they were killed by by Russians. And it means that a number of uh, um, artworks were not created and they have not transferred their knowledge, their expertise to others. They didn't teach the next generations. It means we are losing again the time, the most precious thing we have. We're again losing the time to, you know, to, to raise another artistic uh, generation. So I think this loss is tremendous and the fact that war is going on it's continuing and it will continue means we will have even more losses so every day means you know losing more lives losing more time um more um, precious uh, precious time yeah sorry what was the second question <laughs> and the second one really is 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 resisting aggression i mean resisting obviously aggression. militarily yeah. central stage but our artists culture are playing a mm -hmm. crucial role in uniting uh allies behind ukraine and and i'm guessing giving uh ukrainians the energy to resist and fight and protect their identity yeah absolutely i mean so the role of art in the first stage of the war, when everyone in the, of the invasion, when everyone was just, you know, shocked and 
uh, of just lost in what was happening. So these artistic interventions, like, I don't know, uh, Andriy Hlivniuk singing this uh, famous song in, in San Sofia Cathedral in, in Kiev was um, just a moment of unity and uh, lifting the spirit for all. And uh, um, I remember from the first days that people who were sitting in bomb shelters in underground stations for days and nights when Kiev was under attack, they were watching movies, archival movies, black and white movies, you know. Um, and it was it was very important to to feel that you are united, that you are together, uh, that there is normality behind this uh, nightmare, you know, and you could imagine this normality and remember it through through artworks. And I think that when the first um, artistic events started taking place in Kiev after liberation, it was the 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 um, opportunity for people to feel safe together again, to come together and think about safe things and talk about things and create this space of trust and safety for each other, even if it, even if it is be, just between the uh, uh, air raid sirens, you know, just for a couple of hours. But it was, again, this feeling we are together, life is moving on, we can do it, you know, we will resist again, we have each other, we have other senses and reasons. And, you know, um, we, we, we just have this support in each other and we will help each other to move on and you know to to find answers so there was this huge motivation and uh, uh therapy inside society through art you know all these posters all these meme forces sorry we need humor was so important to keep us moving to keep us rolling you know and to not go mad and insane in this uh, uh past year and a half um, and of, of course, I think it was crucial for international support and international um, understanding and solidarity because every institution in the world did something in solidarity with Ukraine, an exhibition, a concert, something. So culture gives you a space, a platform to, to express this solidarity, to feel this solidarity with others, yeah, to kind of feel... Uh, unity and uh, um, uh, connection to those who need this solidarity. So I think culture played a crucial role in, you know, kind of creating this resistance um, uh, all over the world. It's been extraordinary to to watch that, uh, not just the memes, but also the art exhibitions and so on. It's extraordinary what the advocates of Ukraine and its ambassadors have been doing. I strongly encourage people to go to exhibitions uh, and to attend Ukrainian Institute events, whether it's the London affiliate, whether it's, um, you know, across Europe um, or just watching virtual events. They're extraordinary. And I think it helps people to connect to Ukraine and what they're fighting for, um, which is which is absolutely a just cause. Um Tetian, thank you so much for your time this morning explaining all this to us. I think your insights are absolutely fascinating and I wish you luck with the tremendous work you and your colleagues are doing. Thank you. Thank you for your interest and continuous support and solidarity.